Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with Jim Skelton. Jim is single-handedly responsible for opening many of our eyes to the finer things in the knife life, thanks to his beautifully shot and in-depth video reviews of high-end and custom knives. But over the past few years, his videos have on YouTube have tapered off just a touch, and his commitment to the knife game has gone through the roof. Uh, Jim is proprietor of Skelton Blade Works, selling out his co uh, coveted custom knives through dealers and shows, and uh, venturing into collaborations. He's got two, and I'm real happy it gives us an excuse to catch up. But first, are you crazy about knives? Do you like this show? Well, check us out on Patreon. There are three levels of support. You get Knife Junkie stickers, I mentioned on the podcast, early access to Sunday, the Sunday interview and midweek supplemental shows with uh, no ads throughout the show, and you get more. Your support helps fund the infrastructure needs of the show, hosting, servers, apps, and equipment, as well as knives for review and giveaway. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us can get you. The quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? Then you're probably a knife junkie. Jim, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. You know, I love that opening because that is exactly the sickness that I've had for so many years. You have packages one, two, and three on the way that you're tracking, and you start scrolling through Blade HQ or somewhere, and you're already on the hunt for the next knife. Like, you've already gotten the other ones, and you're already bored with them. So, yeah, I identify very closely with that. I, I think a lot of that has to do with how many videos we might watch when we obsess over a knife. You know, you watch so many videos, you feel like you, you've you almost owned the knife at, at a certain point. You know, it, it's true. I, I do the same thing. I dive in deep with everything that I'm interested in, whether it's motorcycles, knives, uh, guns, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, it, it's funny because a, I think a lot of what got me inspired way back when it's been about 10 years now to start doing reviews on high-end custom knives was when i made that transition from buying you know 25 50 75 dollar knives and being happy with them to discovering the world of custom knives and i went out there and i started looking i'm like oh who's this brian ty guy who is this you know who is that who's this and there were very few videos really about high-end customs there's a lot of stuff you know this was back in the day when YouTube videos were ruled by guys like nothing fancy. I mean, and he's gone way off into guns and everything else, but he did a lot of knives back then. Mm -hmm. He had guys like uh, Tough Thumbs. You had Jeff out there doing stuff. There was uh, Wieners and Steel guys. You had all these amazing people out there, but there wasn't a lot. There wasn't a pro uh, proliferation of high-end customs. As I started doing, I said, well, hell, I might as well just make some videos of the stuff that I have coming in and share them with people because a lot of that stuff, you know, there's maybe only one is going to be made or 10 are going to be made or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe people won't have a chance to see it if you don't share what you own. So I started doing that and out of nowhere, the popularity sprung up and I got a whole bunch of subscribers and everything else. And it really just began as, as, a, as a fun little project and my way of sharing like we do on forums and Instagram and everywhere else, just sharing, Hey, I just got this cool knife in check it out, this and that but you had more of a chance to describe it. And, and that was your opportunity to kind of dig deep and talk about the maker and talk about the materials, not just snap a picture and go, Hey, look at this cool thing that I got. So you had a lot of people doing production knives, a few people doing a few custom knives here and there. Um, you know, but as you know, it takes a budget to be able to buy all those knives. And at, at that time I was making a, a rather good income so I was buying three, four, five, seven thousand dollars worth of knives every month. Wow. So I always had stuff to make content with, yeah. and uh, a lot of other people didn't. And all of a sudden, we started seeing some of those guys coming out. You know, they had you know almost an infinite budget, far more than what I could afford, and they would start showing off really cool things: GTCs and Kirby Lamberts and 
Ron Best and all these wonderful, amazing makers. And we all got to learn from each other. We were kind of a tight knit community for a while. And now it's kind of exploded. It seems like, you know, you, you turn on YouTube and everybody's got, everybody's got my carbon fiber background. Everybody's <laughs> doing my first person view. When I did it, people were doing this. They were going, and hey, look at the edge on this and look at this design. They were holding it up to the camera like that. And very few people were doing the first person because I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about the eyes. So they didn't need to see me and, 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 and look at this ugly mug and everything else. It was about focusing on the knife that I had on the table. So now everybody does the same thing. So if, if you've noticed in the past year, I've been playing with different backgrounds and different things to, to hopefully once again differentiate myself from everyone else that's come up since then. But there, there are some really great guys out there that are doing stuff. I like to watch um, – Metal Complex is one of them. I really enjoy watching his videos. And we've done a few things together where I sent him knives. He sent me knives because uh, I go, hey, man, that was a really cool knife that you reviewed. Can I take a look at it? Oh, sure. And he sent it right on over. So there, there is still a, there's a lot, a lot of great uh, information out there and so much more. When you click that buy button, whether you've, whether you've researched the purchase or not, I find it to be just as much fun after I've made the purchase. Now I'm going to go research more about this thing that I bought and yes. watch other people playing with it. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like um, uh, a back justification. It's like okay, yeah. I just spent the money. I got to make sure I got I got to check back in with Jim. Make sure he, you know, I remember he <laughs> liked this. Uh, um, I think that uh, sometimes uh, reviewing custom knives or expensive knives can be alienating in that some people are. Uh, viewers might not be as interested because I either it's out of reach or it's a very, very limited thing that you're talking about. But um, just kind of in a Randall made knives phase currently, you know, I oh, come in wow. and out of all sorts of phases. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but there aren't too many videos on YouTube uh, by by the trusted people I know, or by really by too many people at all, actually, yeah. on Randall made knives, which is funny because they've been around since 1937. You'd think that, well, in any case, so what you, what you were doing with those videos and still continue to do um, with the videos is, uh, is actually a pretty valuable service because you can find any number of videos out there on the mini Griptilian, but you can't find too many on uh, custom Brian Ty, for instance. And if you're gonna actually, uh, commit that money, you know, and the and I'm sure it takes some eff effort too to to hunt down some of these custom knives. If you're going to put all that into it, you do want to get someone else's backup. It's always good, yeah. And and going back to the beginning of that, you know, I, I've had plenty of of uh, negative comments in the in the comments section regarding, well, you know, you're just showing off something expensive that no one else can own. Why would somebody want to watch that? And I watch videos about Ferraris yeah. and Bentleys, and like I, I love Doug DeMiro. I will watch every video Doug DeMiro makes. I'm never going to be able to afford a three million dollar McLaren. That doesn't matter. I can still enjoy what it is and to learn about, uh, you know, what may make that particular car so amazing. I find it fascinating. Yeah, maybe I'll hit the lottery one day, and I'll know more precisely what I'm going to buy. But for somebody that loves, you love any category, let's say it's knives. If you love knives in general, you know, you may be carrying a buck 110 and you may dream of owning a zero tolerance. It doesn't matter what your budget is. You can still enjoy the history of knives. You can enjoy the modern um, modern production of knives, the things that are going on today. What steels are popular, what, why people like certain steels over others. Uh, why some people like, uh, you know, tip up carrying, why other ones are wrong and <laughs> all those things in between. It's fun because you, the more you watch, the more you get to learn. Hopefully you're learning from somebody that actually knows what the fuck they're talking about. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. I don't know if we can drop the F-bomb in here, um, but hopefully you're learning from somebody who knows what they're talking about. And the more you watch it, the more you get involved in it, the more I think you're going to love it and the less buyer's remorse you're going to have. Yeah, Because you'll see a lot of people that are new into knives that will jump into the these different Facebook groups, for example, and go, you know, there's so much out there. I'm looking at maybe a Chris Reeves Sabenza or a Strider SMF. What, what would you guys do? And as you learn, you'll figure out what you like. 
You know, you won't have questions that are so broad and compare two knives that really don't compare to one another at all. Right. But you're just jumping into it. You're like, well, OK, four hundred dollar price range. And I'm seeing these knives coming at me. Which one's better and why and this and that? And what are people's preferences? And, and I think sometimes we like to lean on other people's experience. And I do a lot of that when it comes to motorcycles, you know, because it, you, you go out and spend, uh, I just had a new seat put on my, my CDO and there's a lot of different seat options out there. And you want to hear from other people, you know, that ride, uh, you know, six, seven, eight hours at a time versus the guy that may put a thousand miles a year on his bike. I want to know what your experience is. We may have different asses. We, we may have different requirements for that seat, but at least I can feed off of what you're saying. And if you hit on those key points, oh, it's got good back support. Oh, after three or four hours, I'm not getting hot spots. I'm not having to adjust. Those are the things that I wanted to know about. And you validated my interest in that particular brand. And it saves me money. I don't have to go through three or four seats to get the one that's going to work for me. So I think we do the same service for knives that we've seen for decades with, with cars and motorcycles and everything else. And it's fun. More than anything, it's fun. We've got a great community, a lot of really great people. And uh, that's generally what you hear about the most. What people enjoy about the knives is, oh, I got to know this person or that person. And after doing 10 trades, we finally met at Blade Show and had a couple of drinks and uh, things like that. So it's, it is a community. But there's a lot of really good information in there that will help you on your journey if you're willing to listen. If you walk in with an attitude like, I know what I want. I don't think that knife is worth that much money and you're never going to talk me out of it. No, man, open your mind and, and see what you There are people that go, I don't understand why I would spend $100 on out the front automatic knife. It's, that's not what that person carries. That's not what they're into. They can't justify it. Well, don't walk in with that defensive attitude. No. Hey, why do you guys like the more expensive out the front? What makes them better? That's a different way to approach it, and you're going to get a lot more knowledge out of it, and you might find new interests that you're going to have going down the road. Yeah, uh, it's those it's those videos, that attitude and approach, and then and then and this is something actually uh, that is something you is a concern for you now as as a not only as the proprietor of Skelton Blade Works, but also as someone who's doing custom, uh, I mean, uh, production collaborations. You have an opportunity through many companies. CRKT is awesome at this, uh, ZT and, and many, many others. Uh, but you have an opportunity to try out the designs of way out of reach. You know, I can't get an RJ Martin, but sure. I can I can get a Kershaw uh you know, it's funny, RJ Martin, you're either spending $5,000 or like five bucks. There's like nothing. Uh, but but in any case, uh, it's those uh, uh, production collaborations with custom knife makers that allow people to get into a Skelton Bladeworks knife, for instance. Now, uh, well, with BRK and and now with Riot. Uh, how, how do you feel about that? Was that something that kind of uh, pulled you in to the... To the custom world, uh, any sort of a uh, that sort of access to less less costly but still high concept design. Well, it's funny when I when I was into just production knives, or I didn't know that customs really existed. I didn't know that there was a maker behind so many of the, the production designs that were out there. And you know, I think a lot of people that buy clones, knockoffs, whatever you want to call them. You know, they're always justifying why they're why they're uh, why they're buying those. And you listen to people jump in and go, well, no, it is hurting somebody because, you know, somebody designed that knife. And they're getting paid a very small percentage by that huge company that's making them. You're only looking at the name Benchmade and going, well, that's a, that's a huge corporation. I'm not hurting anybody if I buy a knockoff or a clone or whatever you want to call them. But no, you are. You're hurting the guy that's getting five, eight, ten percent of all those knives that sell because you bought the cheap knockoff version. So I, I wasn't aware that there was a name, that there was a real name behind a lot of those knives until I started learning and listening to other people. And I went, oh, now I get it. Sure, many are just mass produced and designed in-house by these different brands. But 
you know, now we see so much more, uh, so many more makers that are becoming uh, very closely involved. And, and Ken Onion was was a really big uh, influence uh, in, in the industry for that, uh, you know, back in the early days with Kershaw. And a lot of people wanted to follow in his footsteps. And I'll tell you right now, when I first started, I never thought I would ever have the ability to, to have a knife that would be popular enough uh, or recognizable enough that a company would say, hey, we want to make a production version out of it. And that's kind of the dream that you have as, as a knife maker. One is to make it to the point where your designs are recognizable enough where people know it's yours. Mm -hmm. um, and then a company would show interest in making it whether you had to approach them or not, but it's even better if they approach you. Hey, we like what you do. We want to make a version of it. Then the other big dream is to become, you know, a, a Strider, Hinderer, Reeve, uh, Marfion. I mean, because th those are your big four. Those are the guys that, and, and now Medford. Whether people like Medford enough or Medford or not, it doesn't matter. When you look at the explosive growth that he's uh, undergone in the past seven, eight years, you're, you're looking at somebody that went from making maybe knives in their basement or in a trailer or in their garage to, you know, decades later having a multi-million dollar business with 20, 30 employees manufacturing tens of thousands of knives that people have a demand for. Yeah. That's, that's the real dream. That's where everybody wants to be. So um, I've made, I made it uh, you know, a little step up into where I want to be. And I don't want to be at that level. I don't want to be a Rick Hinder. I don't want to be a Mitch Strider or, or Chris Reeve. But it's, it's fun to know that you can sit back and have money just coming in the mailbox. And yeah. you can relax a little bit because as a custom knife maker, every single knife that you make, that's money out of your pocket until it's sold. And if you can't make enough, you can't make enough money. And most of us don't have health insurance because we can't afford seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars a month just to pay for health insurance. So God forbid we have an injury. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you you slice through a tendon or something, and you you can't work for six months. Well, that's six months you don't make any money. So it's nice to have that fallback. It's not about the money. It's about the 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 respect that the company gives you by coming to you and making your your design and and the enjoyment of watching other people enjoy it. But when things like that happen, sure, it can become about the money. You want to be able to just walk out to the mailbox sure. and, yeah. and get that, uh, that mortgage money or something, you know? This this uh, this whole um, scenario, as we're discussing it right now, reminds me of an actor being plucked out of obscurity by a producer at the laundromat. You, you've got that X factor. You know, suddenly their life changes overnight. It's kind of, I would imagine, a similar thing, you know, oh, especially if a company as well respected with knives as great as Bark River Knives or knives as great as Riot come knocking or, or they say, we find your design so compelling. We want to make 100 or 500 or whatever they make, you yeah. know, uh, that's yeah, that's. Been I've and then, very, and then getting those royalties—that's that's also nice. That mailbox. I've been fortunate because there are a lot of different ways that you can enter into those collaborations. You know, either you're doing a collaboration where uh, they're investing in you and you're investing, or you're co-branding and they're doing all the investing and you don't have to invest, or you're paying to have knives made and then they're selling them. There's so many different ways to approach it. Um, and, and like you mentioned, Bark River was the first uh, that I did, and that was with my occipital. And I try to be very careful with how I'm doing that because I don't want to take away from the experience for my customers. Because I know a lot of custom makers who will do a collaboration or sign off to have a production knife made, whatever. And it's very, 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 very close to a custom knife that they're currently offering. Mm. And today, with the quality, let's say React is a great example. With their quality, they're so close to being as good as the custom for so much less money. I feel like, hey, you're cannibalizing your own business, but I think you're also doing your customer a disservice. So when I decided to do the occipital with uh, Bark River Knives, I discontinued making them. I stopped making them entirely and didn't make another one. When I entered into the agreement to do the tibia with Riyadh, I stopped making, made a big announcement. I'm going to make, you know, X number more. 
these will be the last, actually the last four went to a dealer. I think they went to, I think it was DLT trading or a knife center. Um, and so that's it. There will be no more. I will never make another, not even for myself. That way I don't ever put myself in jeopardy of, you know, I don't know, disrespecting uh, any of the customers that spend, you know, because my, the custom tibby is started at uh, four and a quarter or 475. That was the lowest price. And then they went up from there up to, you know, eight or nine hundred dollars. So if somebody's going to spend that kind of money, I'm not going to turn around and make a two, three, four hundred dollar version. That's honestly, they did this identical. I mean, down mm -hmm. to my uh, plunge lines and everything, because I, I do the the sweeping plunges. They did everything identical. The speed holes and the fuller. Oh, the dimensions are exact. The jipping is done the exact same way. So they did an amazing job. Here's the uh, the leather sheath, by the way. A lot of people got excited when I said, yes, it's going to come in a horizontal carry leather sheath. I love that. I love that. And and I got to tell you, Jim, that's a beautiful knife. I, I'm a sucker for a Warncliffe, and that <laughs> that to me is just – that's. Yeah, this was my second design. Cool. I designed the occipital. Um, then I designed the tibia right after it, uh, a couple of weeks after. And then the whole point was just to make something that was super easy to conceal and under just a T-shirt, be small enough for that. So I went with a kind of a short handle. Yes. I wanted still to have a good full four-inch blade. So you got a four-inch cutting edge. It's flat ground. So that what, I, what I'm able to do, and we did the same thing with Riyadh, was I was able to go down to an absolute laser sharp edge but because it's flat ground, it's, it's got support behind that edge. So if you want to do some light chopping, mm -hmm. I think my third or fourth customer on this, he basically just wanted to chop ribs huh. when he does his barbecues. Yeah. So little light chopping tests, it was good for. I did them all in 3D when I made the customs and some in Damascus. But it was, it was a good way to get that balance of it'll be laser sharp, but it, it can still handle a little bit of abuse. We're doing these. In RWL 34. Nobody knows that yet. I haven't announced that yet. Ooh, here. right here. It's an exclusive. Everybody's kind of expecting, well, it's coming from Riyadh. It's coming from overseas. It's going to be M390. Or it's mm -hmm. going to be S35 VN. We push this to the max. We actually decided to do um, RWL 34, which takes a fantastic finish. Uh, we made the handles nice and slim for everybody, so it's easier to carry. Did the leather sheaths. Um, they just did an overall amazing job I, I couldn't be happier with their interpretation of my work and david is a is a fantastic uh businessman as well as a fantastic person and uh he was super easy to deal with it's taken a long time you know corona shut everything down for a yeah. year and i have i have three more projects coming out i have flippers i've designed flippers uh based on my fixed blades and that i designed just to be flippers and they're all coming out in this next year because oh, they that is bottleneck. Sweet. But they're they're yeah. coming out through Riot also. Uh, not through Riot. Um, I haven't announced the other brand yet because we're we're kind of keeping it a secret uh, because I don't want to say why, but we're keeping okay. it a secret for right now. Um, but there there will be. Some, we know uh, we have announced before. Custom Knife Factory is doing the little finger in a flipper. Here's oh yeah, yeah. Here's I a like little, finger little finger in Damascus that I'm working on. So it's basically that design. That'll be made into a flipper. Sweet. Very, there's a lot of work going into that one. Um, so that'll be the first flipper. Then I have three more that are coming out soon. And uh, I, as you know, the flashlights and everything else. I'm trying to keep myself busy during my downtime since I've been dealing with my health issues. Um, I've got ruptured discs in my neck, uh, degenerative discs in my neck, um, bulging discs in my back. I've had heart issues and everything else. Ooh. So. The, for the past six months, I've kind of had a, a rough go at it, and I haven't been able to work very often. And uh, I've been blessed with absolutely uh, amazingly patient customers who I'm now starting to catch up on. You know, so I've got you know knives that I'm working on here, <laughs> sweet Starlight, um, and trying to get back up on the horse. But I've been able to focus while I've been dealing with all that stuff on these production collaborations and. Next Friday, uh, for, what is it? To, uh, yeah, so in five days, uh, over at Focus Design Works, we're actually doing the official ordering for the Cylon EDC light. 
So those are titanium, copper, brass, smoke dyes, zirconium. Okay. Um, everything. You know? All right. All right. All right. You're going to have to. I, I have a lot going on. All wait, wait, wait. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you do. And, and there are actually a couple of things. We'll get to the Cylon in a minute. Cause I, oh, okay. because uh, I have, I have flashlight questions and, and, and you can tell I do because I call it a flashlight. Okay. But uh, <laughs> we'll stop right there. Uh, a couple of things about, about the, um, the, uh, sip, uh, the, the tibia. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to back up. I love the short, handle design. I like to carry um, fixed blades uh, in my waistband um, mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of at a 45 degree angle or so. And and uh, I've made a couple of knives for myself just in my garage and such. And in doing so, I've always made the handles real short because when you sit down or you get in the car, if you have anything extra on the side, boy, a, a long knife handle really points it out to you. So, yes. so uh, it looks like that the handle on that knife then plus that nice thumb swale is is perfect not only for for stashing but it looks like it's it's enough to manage that nice big ass blade i love that blade it's uh, nice and comfortable the uh the thumb depression is heavily gimped so it won't move uh under your thumb right we also added the lanyard hole so you can add a uh, tight knot lanyard so you have uh, a place for this finger to go. It'll feel more like a four finger handle at that point when you do that. Um, but, you know, I noticed a lot of people when they were making stash knives, by the way, knives, small knives, they were doing it with short blades and full size handles. And to me, it's the it reverse. Wrong. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, a my, my dog is a pit bull that's mixed with a corgi. <laughs> so he's, he's a pit bull. With these little bitty corgi legs, <laughs> and that's it. what it reminds me of when I see uh, a full-size handle and this little tiny blade sticking out. So I decided to do the opposite. Very few people were doing it like that, and but there's enough to get a good firm handhold. It's certainly not going to go anywhere in your hand, and that was kind of what my first few designs were: the uh, the occipital, the tibia, the advanced tibia, same way, short handle, long blade. Um, and then I started doing more balanced stuff like the Hellraiser. So you had four inch blade, four and a half inch handle, five inch handle. So you had, a, because it was meant to be a full size knife, not a hideaway knife. These are carried in a, a horizontal carry. So I carry mine over my left jean pocket. Okay. So it's right there. I can, I can draw it out with this hand in a reverse grip, or I can reach over and cross draw it with the other hand. I can do it when I'm sitting in the car, standing up on a motorcycle, whatever. And that I don't like scout carry. I don't believe in that because yeah. uh, back in the nineties, I used to carry a, a spare magazine back there for, for my uh, pistols. And one day a buddy of mine were housing around and we were, we were doing this, um, this uh, disarming technique and he would show me some cool shit and he ends up flipping me over slowly, but rolls me over his arm. I land on my back on the concrete and that thin little magazine, it was for a, Sig 220, so it was just a single stack 45. That one magazine, I thought it separated my vertebrae. It hurt my mm. back so bad I couldn't get up. Mm. Well, I won't scout carry. I won't put anything in the small of my back. But the horizontal carry right over that left thigh, that left leg over that pocket, it's easy to get to with either hand. It's easy to manipulate, and you can come out with whatever hold that you want. But I look at a knife as it's, it's always a tool. I always need something to cut open boxes and stuff like that. But it's always going to be a fallback, secondary, or third defensive weapon. If I can't get to a rifle, if I can't get to my pistol, if I can't get to something that's a stronger force multiplier, this is still better than going bare knuckle against somebody that's coming at you with a weapon. Yeah. So I always, when I design my knives, no matter how ridiculous the design may be, in the back of my mind is, how are you going to hold it? Are you going to be able to use this in a self-defensive manner? So most of my designs fall, actually all of my designs, except for the Starlight, fall into that. That's more of a fantasy knife. Everything else, even this. <laughs> oh, look at that. Yeah, the biggest knife that I've made to date. Yeah, that, uh, this is what the scales are going to look like on it. Um, let's see if I can get it lined up here. So is that front edge? God, that's cool. I, I like the uh, I like the front treatment, uh, the treatment of the scale, the swirly kind of wave treatment. So yeah. is the front of this blade sharp uh, as well, or is it a blunt chop? Yeah, exactly. 
No, uh, all I've done, what I did do was I did taper it off. Mm -hmm. um, right now I'm in the middle of hand sanding this one. This is going to get a hand rub set and finish. I don't know if it's going to show up, but I'm just starting to work mm -hmm. on that. Here's, here's the finish as it comes off of the grinder. And then there's the, uh, the hand rub. Kind so of there we go. before we uh, abandon the tibia, I just want to finish up this. Uh, I've got, first of all, you were, it was your uh, Horizon B um, video that got me to, you're one of the few times I actually paused. Yeah, I like that. One of the few times I actually paused a video and bought a knife mid video. It was that really? you were doing the Horizon B. It was like yellow anodized. Uh, he made it for you. Uh, yes, and, that was my vomit green with the veins. Yes, with, with veins. The blue veins. Yes. Uh, but I, I, uh, I did just that. You're like, really, you know, it, they're not going to be 200 bucks forever. Jump on this. These guys are so, uh, yeah, I mean, Riyadh, it, it seems like a match made in heaven. You having a knife uh, come out through them. Uh the tibia, how many are going to be made and are they available yet? How, what's the deal with that? Uh, we're making 300 right now. Um, they're already made. They're done. All 300 knives, all 300 leather sheets. Because this is Riot's very first first uh, fixed blade knife. They've never made a fixed blade knife before. Wow. Um, they had to design and manufacture special packaging. Wouldn't work with their standard uh, packaging for folders. So we're just waiting for delivery on the boxes, and they're going to go straight out to every Riot dealer. So if you know of a, uh, you have a favorite Riot dealer, whether it's Blade HQ or Knife Center or wherever else, they're going to be available there. And uh, depending on how fast they sell out, we might make another 300 or so after that. Uh, but it's going to be in the, the two-tone silver tones. You're going to have the B-blasted finish with the belt satin uh, bevels with the carbon fiber and silver tone hardware, uh, titanium hardware, or it's going to be the all black. Everything's completely blacked out, the hardware, everything. So those are the two choices that will be made available. Um, we have discussed maybe doing a couple in Damascus, maybe Damasteel. We discussed a few in Timascus handles, things like that. So mm -hmm. we'll see how that comes around. But um, they'll be available at all the dealers. All I can say is soon because I don't know how long it's going to take for the arrival of the packaging. So right now we're at the very, very beginning of March. I believe by the end of March, we should have these available at the dealers. Uh, but if not, I mean, anybody that follows my Instagram, um, I am a promotional whore. So you will not miss the multitude <laughs> of announcements. I will definitely make sure everybody knows they're available. Go buy them. By the way, I have T-shirts available. Go buy them. Kind of <laughs> right, right. Well, um, so... Uh, you mentioned you hinted at flippers. We'll 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 stay away from that for now. Oh, is that one right next to? Well, okay. So we'll we'll stay away from that for right now. There is but, a picture of one if you scrolled a little bit further, but we'll we'll leave it at that. Well, one of my prototypes. So, so how does it work with? Um, you know, I, okay. So I know you have dealers. You you send your knives. I'm sorry. I'm I'm just starting to right get lost in these pictures here. But you send your knives out. You have dealers uh, mm -hmm. who sell your stuff. But do you also sell uh, independently? Do you package stuff? Like, how does that work on your end of things? I stopped taking custom orders two years ago. I officially closed my books uh, because I, I simply could not keep up. Mm. Then I got to the point where I was starting to catch up a little bit. And if someone messaged me directly, I would go ahead and take an order here or there. Because what I wanted to do was focus on all the orders that I had. And I wanted the freedom to make one or two knives available openly on my Instagram every month. Just say, okay, I've got this knife finished. It's $500. The first person who wants it because I enjoy being able to do that. What I, I never enjoyed about uh, buying custom knives was falling in love with a certain maker's work and never being able to get it. Hmm. And my goal was to always have one or two knives a month that I could make openly available and just put it out there. Not, you know, not auctions and things like that. And I have been auctions, but the goal was one to two, just a regular price, put it out there, first come, first serve. Um, I've not been able to do that since the, the health issues that I spoke of earlier, but I will be getting back to doing that. Um, I do supply a, uh, a list of dealers and I've got, I think, 14 dealers that I that I work with. 
and they're phenomenal. There's, I think, four knives total available out of all of them. Uh, my knife center has one. Uh, I think GP knives might have one. So I don't, I don't know, but I'm going to continue to supply the dealers because it's, it's very simple to do it that way. And it's also good to, to, to have your product advertised in that way. So yeah. Somebody is just shopping around. Hey, I'm looking for fixed blades in this price range. And they've never heard of me. They see that and go, hey, that's kind of a cool design. I kind of dig that. Right. And, and who among us doesn't go to Blade HQ on the regular and look at like, what's coming? What's new? Uh, I love hitting that newest tab and just seeing just yeah. seeing all the new stuff that drops in. Even, and I don't really get excited about production knives per se, but Every now and then, you may look at the look at the new uh, the new grip in carbon fiber. Oh yeah, it's, you know what? That's kind of damn cool. Yeah, I might yeah, be yeah. doing a video on one of those soon. Just just saying. Um, <laughs> and back to what you were saying before about the videos, uh, I, I appreciate how you worded that about how I I've slightly tapered off on my videos. <laughs> I, I unfortunately had abandoned YouTube for for quite a while to focus on working. I am really struggling. I am going to make sure I get more videos out. Uh, because there are so many great people that message me all the time going, man, I just, I just like watching your videos and seeing yeah. your thoughts on certain things that I may or may not buy it. I may not be in my price range or it might be, but I just kind of want to hear what you what you think about it. So I am going to try to do some more very, very soon. With, with your videos, it's a deep dive. It, it's kind of a guaranteed 25 minutes or so. And, uh, and, but the, but the great thing about it is if you've watched enough of your videos, uh, if you if you know what information you really want to get, you can you kind of have an idea of where you can bring the cursor if you got five <laughs> minutes, you know, uh, on your coffee break. Uh, but the the length and the depth with which you go into, you know, when I when I said that your your uh, videos have tapered off, my point was really like just because your videos have tapered off doesn't mean your commitment is less. It's like a thousand times more because now it's your living and it's your, well, you, you, before you got into knives and doing the videos of knives, you were in the watch world. Um, mm -hmm. And I've heard a lot of people say, don't get into watches. They are so compelling and lovely, but so expensive. And that, that price jump just happens quickly. Even the cheap stuff gets expensive because you're like, it's cheap. I can afford to buy two, three, four, five, ten of these. <laughs> yeah, and right. Two years later, you look back and go, oh, my God, I've spent like $10,000 on all of those cheap watches. So it's it's a slippery slope because there's there's it's it's one of those things where you, you'll change it with your personality, you know? Yeah, yeah. Same thing yeah. with our knives. I'll carry a certain knife because, I'm, you know, I'm carrying maybe I want to match it to the gun I'm carrying that day or <laughs> Uh, I have a certain That's purpose sweet. for it that day. And later in the day, I'll have a different purpose. I'm going to do a different activity. I'm going to change knives. I'm going to carry that day. Same thing with watches. Yeah. Uh, so what did you take from watches that came with you to knives? I mean, I, I assume you still like watches, but what are the things that you learned and, and ways you evaluated uh, that you've brought into your appreciation of knives and that came from your appreciation into your actual making? I'll put it this way, going from when I was designing and manufacturing watches to now making knives, don't give the customers too many options. And this is the same thing I tell all my knife making friends. If you come out, let's say you're gonna make, let's say you're gonna make a production knife and you, you've got all these ideas in your head. I wanna do 10 different finishes and combinations and this and that. You throw 10 different options at people they're likely not to buy at all because they're overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, man, I like that, but I really like that, and I really like that. And they pick three or four that they really love, and they can't decide between them because they're afraid if I buy this one, I'm going to regret not buying that one, but I can't afford to buy two or three of them. And sometimes they won't make the decision at all. What I've learned is put out what you know people are going to love immediately. And that's always going to be carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is always going to be the mainstay for the tactical style knives. So you're always safe with that. You're always safe with Timascus. Now, if you want to start going off in a desert ironwood and you want to go off into different epoxy resins, there's different customers for that. So you bring out what you know, people are going to really appreciate, they're going to buy it up. Then you come out with more later that other people may appreciate that they didn't like the first ones. The guys that already have it are going, I love this knife. And I like that new color variation. It's been a month. I could afford to now buy that one. 
So it's don't flood the market with your own shit because you're going to cannibalize your own business and you may end up losing business because it was there were too many choices. So limit the choices. Come at it smart. Put as much as you can into each design. Make it as the best that you can possibly make it. And then hold off and slowly release your other ideas. <laughs> uh, that, how did that work with Bark River? Because they offer every model different. in 50,000. Okay. Yeah, we put out hundreds of those and only a handful were similar. Almost okay. everyone was completely unique because we had different options in pins. You had uh, regular pins, mosaic pins. You had liners, no liners. Uh, 32 different types of handled materials. And that was based off of the pre-orders. If you pre-ordered, you had it built your way. And then after they closed the pre-orders, their typical business structure is they're going to build what they want to build for DLT trading. Um, and, uh, Knife oh, my goodness, I'm forgetting the other sorts, and I'm going to feel terrible about it in a minute. Um, the two main sources that they sell through, GP and knives. they put them out there. What's that? GP Knives, is it? No, no, I, I feel awful right now because I just forgot who it was. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. But at that point, then they just put them all out there. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked, too. I opened up the, the page. I'm like, oh, my God, there are so many. There's pine cone resin. There's desert ironwood. There's ivory. There's all these different choices. And it was it was awesome. It really was. It was cool to see it all. But I got a lot of messages. Man, there's like 10 different variations. Like, what? Which one should I buy? I mean, just, the most expensive one. Huh? Yeah, get the most expensive one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's their that's their business plan. I had no say in that. Um, when I sat down with uh, David Deng from Riyadh, we very carefully planned out the finishes, the handle materials, mm -hmm. uh, the sheath, everything that was going to be done so that there was going to be no confusion. I wouldn't be unhappy. He wouldn't be unhappy. We knew what to expect from the very beginning planning stages. Two, two very different contrasting yeah. situations. And, and Mike Stewart uh, is, is an amazing, not only knife maker, but businessman. He's been doing this for 40 years. Yeah. So the way he runs Bark River is the way that works best for them because they make 10,000 knives, sell 10,000 knives a month. You know, so wow. they know what they're doing. I'm not going to step in and go, oh, you know, based on my experience, <laughs> I'm going to go with what he knows. And it worked fantastically. Fantastic. Is that a word? Fantastically? It, it is, is now. It is uh, now. So uh, on what you were talking about before, about, um, you know, you said carbon fiber is something people always want, like always offer what people want first or what you know people want first so that you're not left high and dry with yes. some weird materials or whatever. How does that work with your fantasy designs, like the one you just held up? Now, imagine that that is uh, less utilitarian and, and, and way more specialized in terms of taste. It is. When I prototype something and I make the prototype in the first one, um, I generally make those available. I make them how I want to make them, how I, how I envision it in my head, uh, and then I make it available. And then from that point forward, I'll take custom orders. You know, And then the customer can specify this is the steel, this is the finish, this is the handle material, uh, the finish on the handle material, this is what I want to do. Um, with, the, with the Starlight, for example, so you've got um, there'll be three mosaic pins in here, and then I do a mosaic pin inlay in the blade. So all those get to be matched up. They get to pick the, the different mosaics that they want to use. I'll, wow. I'll buy up a whole bunch and give them different options and tell them what I have available. They can pick the different wood, the different steel, all that kind of good stuff. So for things like that, um, that particular model, I like to go one by one. When I was making the tibias, a lot of times it was 50% me just making what I wanted to make and knowing what people were going to want. And the rest of it was just how the customers ordered them. Uh, I've been fortunate with the dealers, a lot of them just say, oh, just do maker's choice, make it however you want. And I get to experiment. And that's the oh, fun, that's you know, is, is, is trying different things. Like the first time I used uh, mammoth tooth, mammoth tusk. I mean, I was, I was scared. I didn't want to break it, chip it, shatter it. It's so fragile, so easy to break. And, yeah. you know, you're paying $300 for a piece that's only that big. And it's it's kind and of You don't want to disrespect that mammoth, you know, that died and gave you that tooth like that's right. so, you know, that's right. thousands you know of years ago. I disrespect the mammoth. But uh, it, it was something that I wanted to do. I was matching it up with dragon skin, mascus. 
And then I took that in a different direction. I decided to make the, the dragon skin gold instead of the typical nighter bluey, which I had never seen anybody do before. And I sent pictures to Bertie, who makes the dragon skin, and he had never seen it before. So it was kind of a neat thing to do. Um, so I like to be able to experiment and play around. And I love when the customers say, hey, just make it your way. And I'll come back and go, okay, do you want you know, utilitarian, or you want dressy, or do you want wild? And then I'll just kind of go from there and, and see what I enjoy making. That's like uh, getting a tattoo. That 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 um, yeah. uh, analogy came up recently, you know, finding a great tattoo artist and being like, you know, this is the general neighborhood I want it to be in. Uh, I never dictate to my tattoo artist anymore. I find the person I look and I study and I find the person that I trust. Mm -hmm. I let I say this is what I'm going for. Do it your way. Yeah. Because I spent too many years dictating what I wanted. Right. And my vision was garbage compared yeah, to what their talent was. Yeah. Draw it exactly <laughs> like I draw it, and they're like, yeah. "Yeah, but I can draw way better." No, no, no. Do it how I. I could have had so many better tattoos if I had just said, "This is the idea, the theme, what I'm going for. And you figure it out." And I'm like. No, I want to place the moon next to this wing over here and this owl over there. And I would have had better tattoos had I just trust and known to trust them. And I learned that by buying custom knives. That's where I learned that because huh. I, I would, you know, get hooked up with so many amazing, amazing makers. And I just went, you know what? I want this one to be just dressy. I want it to be dressy and beautiful. And, and that's it. If you figure out what materials and how you want to do everything. And every time I did that, I got something in my hand that was better than what I had in my head every single time. So trust your makers. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. If you if if you if your taste is taking you to that maker, trust the maker. Yeah. Uh, so when you're all caught up with your custom work, your books, your every every pre every everyone that's got an order waiting, you're all caught up. Uh, theoretically, right? We're never all caught up, but say you get caught up um would you go back to the the books way of doing it or would you uh go forward with this is what i'm making if you like it this is how much it costs yeah i, I don't really ever want to do books again because you've always got that monkey on your back if i wake up one day and i go i have an idea for a prototype and i really want to do that i want to spend the next three days making that knife that i have in my head well, if I've got 50 orders sitting on my books, I, I have a hard time doing that because yeah. I'm putting aside somebody else's that they're, that they're expecting and waiting for. And uh, like I said, I have, been, I have been blessed with literally the best customers on the planet. Um, you know, when I, when I put up my post about my health issues, going, hey, everything's going to be behind. I don't have an ETA for anybody, um, but feel free to contact me. And, and I should stop there for a second. That's one thing if you're a maker that will piss off the customers to no end. Everybody realizes that we're human beings, that you could have family issues, your roof could collapse from a storm, you know, your house could flood, you could get in a car accident, you could be tending to a dying family member. We're all human mm -hmm. and that everyone understands delays. But if you don't communicate, they're not going to understand where you're coming from. And they're not going to give a shit because they've paid their money, whether it be a deposit or they paid in full, whatever it is. You have a responsibility to make that product. And if you can't make it for some reason within that time frame, it's your responsibility to communicate. Whether you're reaching out to them, you're making a public post for the world to see. Or when you see their, their message come in in your email or your direct messages, don't ignore them. Even if you don't have an answer for them, that's going to make them happy. Respond and go, I'm sorry. I understand that I have a commitment to you. Hmm. This is what happened. I apologize for being late. I'm going to make you a priority. I'm going to make sure you get, you know, what, what you were expecting, even though it's going to be late. So always stay in contact because you see the guys that get blacklisted, are the ones that didn't communicate, they're the ones hmm. that were late. Or we're still taking more orders, which, hey, again, we're all human. You know, they may have taken orders six months ago, but they still have bills today. They need to take new orders. But if they can't deliver, they need you need to stay in communication with your customer. Um, that's that's the most important thing because you don't want to think that you gave money to somebody that's going to take off. Yes. It took your money is never going to make your knife because that, that has happened so many times. We've all seen it.
So don't be that guy. Always communicate. Always let them know that they are important to you because without them, you don't get to pay for all this equipment. You don't get to live the lifestyle that you're accustomed to. You don't get to do what you enjoy. So respect them the same way you would a family member. Anyway, I'm I'm done with that. But uh, I am behind. And as I'm starting to climb back on the horse, I know now roughly when all of my overdue orders are going to be finished. And I don't want to go back to doing books because I don't want that monkey on my back. I have a lot of design work that I want to do, a lot of prototyping that I want to do. And I want to have the freedom to do that. So predominantly, I'll do dealers. I'll do first come, first serve through my social media. And then if somebody messages me out of the blue and says, hey, I love your work. I want to do it. I'll accept an order. But what people have to realize is my customer base has grown tremendously in the four years that I've done this. And I have an open offer to every customer. I always get, you know, free lifetime sharpening as long as I'm alive and making knives. But you always have a spot on my books. And there's a discount after you've, you know, ordered a knife from me. Yeah. Every future knife to make time to make sure I have availability to make a knife for somebody that's, that's bought from me before that says, hey, man, I really want that new model that you're making or I, I need to replace this knife or this or that. And I, I put them in immediately and start making their knives. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to give myself that freedom to always be able to fulfill those promises. It seems like that f- that freedom is something that's earned, though. I, I could see how uh, a new knife maker, when you first start out or, or whenever anyone first starts out, they probably want books, right? They want that oh, guarantee. Yeah. They want to see that there are, I have at least 50 people in line. But but then you work through those and and eventually it's like and I would imagine another pitfall of being a <clears throat> new in the game is uh, not being able to ignore trends. I don't know how else to put it, but like you're either chasing trends or sure. you're making them, you know, uh, in one way or another. And uh, you know, everyone everyone needs to be making titanium frame lock flippers to be relevant. Sure. You know, it is hard. It really is hard. And, and, and as you know, you've seen plenty of my posts where half the replies on a post are, when are you going to make a folder? When are you going to make a folder? When are you going to make a folder? Um, I, I, I don't know if people hounded Bill Luckett like that. He's made fixed blades for yeah. 40 years. That's by all the, he's ever made. By the way, I, I was being facetious. I was being facetious in that. I'm a I'm a yeah. fixed blade collector. I love it. My point is in trends, you know, if, if you if you only watch YouTube videos, you could be a knife maker and thinking, geez, uh, I'm not gonna get oh, yeah. any any traction unless I do this exact kind of thing with bearings it, and, uh, and it's gotta lock, fall shut. Washed with all yeah, drop shut, it's yeah. gotta have bearings. And there there are a lot of makers that have fallen into that because hey, you know, you're gonna make what's gonna sell. Yeah. At the end of the day, no matter how much it may be a passion project for you, you still want to make money and you want to make something that people are going to want to buy. So if titanium frame locks are the thing at at that time, I don't fault anybody for doing it as long as it's not a front flipper. Yeah. (laughs) I don't do the front flipper thing. Um, I just, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Uh, We we can have a whole podcast just just on front flippers and my uh, my distaste for them. However, like front flippers right now are a huge trend. Yeah, and A lot of people are jumping on just because they know if they make it, it's going to sell. And I don't hold that against anybody. You've got families to feed. You've got bills to pay. And if there's, there's, there's a, a hunger out there for something, you know, try to satisfy it. But do it. Don't do it just to do it. Put your own spin on it. Make it. Make it special. Make it worthy of doing. Put your own stank on it. Make it where there was a reason for you to do it. Don't do what everybody else did. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, like I'm a huge fan of recurves. I'm a big fan of recurves and I love harpoons. Yeah. So when I decided to do that on a couple of my models, most notably the Hellraiser, I, it had to be my own. It had to be, it wasn't going to be like anybody else's recurves with harpoons. It had to be a little bit different. And that was important for me to do. Did I break new ground? No, but I made it unique enough where when you see one of my Hellraisers, you know it's mine and you don't confuse it with anybody else's knife. There are a lot of people that make Warncliffs. Oh my God, I couldn't even count how many people have made Warncliffs. But you can look at this and go, it's just different enough that I recognize that as being 
Jim's yeah. knife. Yeah. So if you're going to follow trends, find a way to make it where you, A, enjoy making it, uh, but B, that makes it unique to you in some small way. Maybe it's just the hardware that you're going to use or the implementation of your inlays, something to make it yours where it's not just lost in a sea of everybody else's stuff, you know? Yeah. Hey, titanium frame locks and a stone wash finish and M390, can we can the market bear? If you're making a production knife, fine. I'm sure you can make hundreds of thousands of them. But if you're custom or mid-tech, make it special. Make it worthy where that customer is proud to own it. And it, it stands out. When they lay out their collection to take a picture for Facebook, and say, here's my collection of titanium frame locks. You know, it's 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 titanium Tuesday or it's frame lock Friday. Here's all my titanium frame locks. That one that you made stands out. And somebody makes a comment and goes, ah, I see what you did there. I see that one, that one maker's knife, that one model. They know the name of the model. They know who made it. It was just different enough that it separates itself from the rest. And that's what you always have to strive to do. Don't copy. Don't be a part of the pack. You're not you're not really going to revolutionize anything in this day and age. Right. I still remember when Mick Strider uh, he was being applauded for his nightmare grind, and he's like, "Listen, he goes, I, I thought I thought I did something cool and unique, and nobody ever done it before." He goes, "I opened up a book, and there's there's a cave drawing, a thousand year old knife, <laughs> and that grind looked a hell of a lot like a nightmare grind." He's like, "So nothing is truly new and unique anymore." So I'm not saying you've got to go out there. And reinvent the wheel, but make your wheel a little bit different than everybody else's. Make it worthy of your time to make it. Okay, so uh, uh, before we wrap here, I want to talk about trends just just a little bit more, and and I want to offer this to you, Jim. Oh, the, the front flipper, which I am not a huge fan of myself, uh, though I could be convinced, the front flipper is just sort of the modern locking logical extension of the friction folder. Right, it's just kind of like an updated friction folder, and and I'm not saying I'm a huge friction folder fan, but it has its place in history, and I, and I could see how the front flipper isn't completely inane. Let's just put it that way. Um, I want a knife that when <laughs> I pull it out and I open it, whether it be thumb flicking it or a flipper, I'm not changing my handhold on it for what I need to use it for. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. I have to hold a knife like this and do something goofy where it's now sitting in an odd spot in my hand. And then once it's open and then I can put it back into the grip that I want it to be in. No, that's, that's my problem with the front flipper. I don't, and, and watch, watch people, even the guys that love <laughs> front flippers, watch their videos. They'll flip it open 10 times and they'll say, Oh, it's because I'm in time. It won't lock up. It's because I'm from an, uh, in front of the camera. This this never yeah, exactly. happens normally. I want a knife that's going to lock up every single time, and it's going to be in the handhold position that I want it to be in when I've deployed it. I don't want to have to change my grip. Look at how many guys, all right, are so nitpicky. When they buy, they could buy a $3,000 STI, and they go, I don't want to have to move my hand even a little bit to hit that mag release. I want an extended mag release or slide release or safety or whatever. And we pay the money to modify those guns so that we don't have to move our hand in any way to, to manipulate that, that weapon. That's how I feel about a knife. When it comes out, when it's in my hand, I want it ready to use, whether it's uh, attacking a cardboard box or, or a two-legged vampire jumping out from the bushes. I want it in my hand in a certain way that I know it's going to do the job I want it to do. I don't want to have to hold it gingerly and move it this way and then God, I hope that locks open <laughs> and then put it back in my hand. So yeah. that's what I have against front flippers. It's I don't want to say it's a tactical thing because it's just so overplayed, but it's it's a proper yeah. manipulation thing for me. Yeah, it's more it's more actually uh in the realm of the toy or the fidget spinner. Sure. If, yeah. if you're looking at it in terms of yeah, yeah, I I, yeah. I had the uh, I had the um, the O stop hell front flipper uh, that I think is just beautiful, and I can't uh, the metamorph. 
I love that. I loved it. Loved everything about it, except it kept stabbing me in the palm. And and I know it's operator error, but I'm like, how long? I've been playing with knives for 40 years. How long do I have to play with this one before I don't stab myself? And yeah. uh, I'm sure there are many people out there just being, just stop being like such a mama Luke and you'll, and you'll be fine. So it's a great thing. These are first world problems. We can sit there and think yes, about front flippers. Exactly. We have a world of choices available to us. So it's a great problem to have. It is a great problem. So uh, what are the trends that are going on right now that don't stick in your craw? Hmm. That's actually a question I wasn't prepared for. You're good, Bob. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot now. There's still plenty of guys that are dressing up a lot of stuff with tie maskets and mocha tie and damn steel and things, which I love. Everybody knows that I love the flashier looking stuff. But I'm seeing a lot of really, really great makers that are simplifying things a little bit. And I'm not, I don't want to say making their knives more basic, but not dolling them up as much. They're relying, you know, I look at Michael Raymond as, as such a, an amazing example of what true craftsmanship is. If you look at Michael Raymond's knives, if you kind of squint and look out the side of your eye, it's a Sabenza. But so there's nothing earth shattering about his design. But when you look at his finish work, and the photography he does himself is absolutely mind-blowing. And you get these close, detailed shots, and you look at his very, very fine finish work. You look at the way all of the materials are made it together. You look at his pivots. That he, man, he makes his own custom tools for every knife that he makes for that pivot. He makes a pivot tool for it so you can take your knife apart. And when you open that knife, everything on the inside of the knife that you could not otherwise see is finished as beautifully as the exterior surfaces. That to me is the most exciting thing. And not a lot of makers are at that level that can do that. But I'm noticing a lot of makers now, I, I spent about an hour on the phone with Jamie Simeon uh, last week. And I said, you know, one of the things I love about your work is, A, you, you don't shy away from a challenge. That, that one, that, that unique grind that he does where he puts that, um, that hollow grind right here in the middle of his grinds yeah. and brings it to the tip. I'm like, you, you had the balls to do that. And I know it's not easy to do, but you're putting so much emphasis on your finish work now that I love looking at every knife that you put out, even if it's the same model over and over. Every knife is a little bit unique. Every knife is special because of what you're putting into it. When most makers would go, knife's done, looks great. He's probably putting another 10, 15 hours into it. And I'm seeing that more and more with so many really, really talented makers, even very young, very new makers that are learning from professionals, that are learning from their elders, that are saying, it's in your finish work. Mm -hmm. Everything else that you're doing, you can be compared to everybody else. Put it in your finish. And when you look at certain knives that are $1,000, and it's just a simple, basic titanium frame lock with some exotic steel that it doesn't really inspire you. And then you look at somebody else's for the same price, and they've got a beautiful, just a gorgeous, let's say, mother of pearl collar around their pivot. Something that if they sneezed while they were carrying it across the shop was going to crack in half. And they took that time to mill it in there and then to finish it perfectly and to not break it and to lay it in there or do an inlay inside of their pivot head. The little tiny details like that, really, I love to see so many more makers more and more and more paying attention to that because I think it took a long time to learn. It doesn't matter what your name is. It doesn't matter how popular you are online. At some point, people are going to stop paying inflated prices to be in the cool dude club to own one of your knives that have 120 grit finish on the bevels. They want something special for the money that they're spending. And if they can pull out their knife when their buddy's showing them their knife and they, well, they want to see that guy go, wow, man, that pivot's really cool. Or that finish is really amazing. Or I've never seen the light dance off of a mirrored finish like that before. It's putting it in that finish work. And so many makers nowadays that are focusing on that instead of flashy materials, and there's yeah. nothing wrong at all with flashy materials. God knows I love them. 
but I love to see how many guys right now are just stopping. They're, they're taking everything out of their mind. They're ignoring the, the, the workload they have on their shoulders. They're ignoring a show schedule they got to build 10 knives for. They're stopping and they're going, okay, what can I do just to make this knife a little more perfect? And I'm so happy to see that trend finally coming up out of a lot of years of people just, I think I'm going to make a knife. They make a titanium frame lock and they, people just start buying them. So they jack up their prices. And yeah. next thing you know, a knife that should have been 400 bucks, twelve, fifteen hundred dollars And people are going, why, why are you spending that much? Now, a lot more often you can hold up a knife and justify yeah. why you spent that much. Yeah. I, I was going to say that kind of quality in finish, um, Shows shows itself to non knife people. A, 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 a non knife person could see that knife and evaluate it uh, based on the way it's finished and the way uh, you know, not knowing anything about knives or or knife making or any anything. Yeah, like that. Absolutely. I always go back to analogies with cars, motorcycles, and guns because it's things that I love. You could hand somebody a perfectly well made, really nice Beretta, and you hand them a Cabot nineteen eleven. And somebody that knows absolute nothing about gun or machining or finishing can very easily tell you that that $10,000 cabinet is a much higher end gun than that Beretta. You know, there's nothing wrong with the Beretta. The machining is great. The finishing yeah. is great. There are different levels. And you don't have to know the difference when it's that over the top, when it's that perfect. Yeah. You don't need to know anything about women's shoes to know that if it's got a red bottom, she's a fancy lady. I'm wearing red. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Jim, it's been a pleasure talking with you, man. Thank, thank you for uh, so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and making lewd gestures at me. I appreciate it, man. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate you reaching out. It's It's been a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing it the first time. I enjoyed it even more this time. And uh, I, I'm happy to see that you're getting more and more and more viewers. You deserve it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And everyone, uh, keep your eye out for the tibia coming out from Riyadh. Uh, it's their first fixed blade knife. And uh, and of course, it's Jim's second collaboration, uh, production collaboration knife. And uh, well, it's Don't a sweet, forget about the Cylon. It's a sweet Warren clip. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm sorry. Let's talk about the Cylon real quick. Oh, OK. The, uh, no, no, no. I, I because I wanted to talk about this in this in this interview. Uh, you do flashlights. Tell me about the Cylon real quick. Let's I don't know if it'll show up very well, but there is the brass version that we're doing. Um, I've been a flashlight collector for a while. I like pocket torches. I like EDC lights. Um, and for those that aren't into them, it's very easy when you're getting into custom lights. You're starting at around 400 bucks, and it's easy to drop a 1000 bucks oh on, on a custom light. Um, and... As they get rarer and harder to get, like a good Hanko, yeah. a Hanko that would have cost you six fifty, you're going to spend twelve hundred bucks on now, just because it's not easy to get. Yeah. You get one in Timascus, and it's three or four thousand dollars. So, um, I've I've got fascinated. My my buddy Jerry actually turned me on to him. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. I'm like, what? Are, a flashlight is a flashlight. He's like, dude, you're going to use a flashlight way more than a knife. Hmm. And once you start carrying one, I promise you will. So I bought. A Hanko uh, twist from him. And this was when they were really starting to get popular. And he didn't even overcharge me. He's like, oh. So I did it. And when I started carrying it. I'm like, man, I use this thing every day. Like, I'm using my light a lot. And I loved every every detail about it, just like we love custom knives. We love the work that goes into them. So it's, it's more about the workmanship and the style than it is the utilitarian nature of it. Because we all know, you know, this is a $1,300, $1,400 knife. This doesn't cut any better than a $50 knife. Yeah, but there's yeah. a lot of reasons for that cost justification. Same thing with lights. And when I really got into lights, I said, you know what? I, I design a lot of the things that I love. Um, so I sat down and I designed a couple of lights. And I searched for two years to find someone that, could, that was a good enough machinist to be able to make my design. And I couldn't find one. I thought I found one. They started kind of working on it, and then nothing ended up ever happening. And I, I thought I was going to give up. And then I bought a Focus Design Works Eric's F1, and I reviewed it. It was one of the, the light reviews that I did. 
And I was so blown away, blown away by the quality of the, of the workmanship and the machining that I said, this is the guy Cavern that will life. actually be able to machine at the level that I need him to. And of course, you know, knowing me, I'm big on tritium and things that glow in the dark and stuff like that. Cool. That's actually going to be our next one, the Caprica. So you're getting kind of a sneak peek there. So I talked to Jordy. Directly. I said, man, I said, your, your machining is amazing. If I sent you a sketch, you think you could apply it into your, your world into CNC and make it real. And would you be interested in doing something? And I showed it to him. He's like, dude, that's fucking crazy. That's nuts. That's an amazing light. So I showed him all the designs. He turned things around and made it where it was more realistic, where it could actually be actually made. And I said, I want to put tritium here and tritium there and this and this and that. And in less than a year, we now have our prototypes done for the Cylon. Um, we have done a pre-order. We have about 70, 80 people on the pre-order right now. And this upcoming Friday, he's going to open up the website uh, on an actual full order list where you can purchase it, order it right there with or without tritium. You don't have to have tritium if you don't want it. Um, and all these different materials, the titanium version started at 975 and they go up from there. We've already had somebody order a Zircotai, somebody order a Mokotai. Those are two, wow. $3,000 lights, but they're triple emitters. They're over 1800 lumens. Um, they've got secondaries, custom secondaries, red, blue, green, whatever you want. Custom UI, custom dragon drivers. You can set it up to do pretty much whatever you want it to do. Um, they're fantastic, and I feel so I feel so blessed to have hooked up with Jordy and for him to have accepted this collaboration. Um, so we're doing the Cylon now. Maybe hopefully next year we'll have the Caprica. will be out, and then we are going to do a budgetary version called the Viper. And if somebody hears all three of those names and doesn't get the theme that I've got going on there. I'm going to have to smack you around. <laughs> but, uh, I'm very excited about them. Um, it's it's not knife related, but it, for a lot of us, it's as much as a, yeah. of a required EDC item as, as a knife is. I don't go anywhere without a flashlight these days. Yep. Yep. Me too. And, and, and people, uh, fans of the show bust on me because I, I haven't, I, I haven't really crossed over into, I have an Olight now. So that's a, mm -hmm. that's good. I like pens. Uh, I like knives. I, I, I can't really afford to, to go too much further afield. Dip your toes in the water. I'll tell you right now, one of the originators and one of the best, coolest looking, most awesome lights, the Gizmo Haiku. And they're only like 480. And that is a custom order direct to Don. You're emailing Don. He's making it for you. And believe it or not, within like four days, the light arrives at your oh home. God. And I, I did a video. You can go look at the video. You can watch. You can see how beautiful the light is. And that'll give you a taste for, I have a custom machine titanium light that I didn't spend a thousand bucks on. And you'll understand. You're going to carry that and go, okay, now I get it. Now I understand why people are spending this money. That's what I would start you off with before you go chasing grails like Hankos and oh, Tridents geez, and stuff man. like oh, that. God. This is all custom well, knife money. <laughs> this is money yeah. that could be going to something sharp. It gets worse. It gets so much worse. <laughs> it gets so addictive. But start there. Get him a Gizmo Haiku, and okay. I promise you, you'll love it. And all right, it's well, somewhat affordable. If, if I actually do it, we'll talk about it next time, and, and we'll talk about the watches and the knives and the other things I've bought in the meantime. But uh, until then... Jim, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks again for Thank coming you. on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Thank you to all your viewers. Visit the Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. Man, first he gets me into the expensive high-end production knives with his video on Riot way back when, and now I'm starting to think about flashlights or torches or whatever I'm supposed to call them. I'm going to call them flashlights for now because... As soon as I start calling them torches, I think I'm already invested. So uh, anyway, it was a pleasure, pleasure catching up with Jim Skelton. Um, always, always exciting. And I'm really happy to see this tibia come out. It does look like something that's way up my alley. And I'm going to stop right there. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, uh, I'm Bob DeMarco saying come back and join us next week for another great interview. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.